Hey everyone, Ivan Legato here, Max Ask Commentator at Global Prime Brokerage Fem. With me today, I have Chris Laurie. Chris, how are you? Thanks for having me. I'm, I'm doing well, thanks. And you? I know that it's very early. You are an early bird today, 7 a.m. local time in Canada. And uh, you told me in the correspondence that uh, we were exchanging early this week that it's been uh, Thanksgiving uh, this, uh, this week in Canada. Correct this me past weekend was Thanksgiving. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to touch on that in a second. But first of all, obviously, I want to uh, introduce you very briefly. You've been a veteran of the markets for over two decades, mainly, you know, primarily Forex uh, trading. You also manage large funds for uh, private investors and, uh, you know, institutional clients. And also you run the educational site Pro Traders Club. Now, in a past life or prior to trading, uh, you were also involved in the uh, sport of Bob Slate, and uh, you led the Canadian team from very low ranks to actually become the overall World Cup winner in the sport of Bob Slate, an achievement that I know you're very, very proud of. Uh, <laughs> now, uh, with that being said, why I wanted to touch on, hey, this week has been Thanksgiving in Canada. If you actually had to look back 12 months, in the last 12 months, is there anything in particular that in terms of, you know, harvesting and blessing, you're most blessed, you're most proud of what's been achieved in the last 12 months in your either trading career or personal life? Well, I think in the last 12 months, um, it's been really because I've just ever since I started in sport, I was used to, you know, spending a large percent of percentage of my time traveling and being in different places. And, and it really was uh, quite wonderful to be able to to have uh, more time with uh, family and friends and build more community. Because mm -hmm. uh, I've got like multiple, I've got communities all over the world, but to actually spend uh, a lot of time with the community that's that's most important to you and, mm -hmm. and family, uh, you know, when, when you can uh, has been has been great. And, and also um, my mom is 87 now. So I've wow. Mm -hmm. had a chance to uh, and we're because we're there's eight kids in my family and there's they're spread all over the, the world really and and so it's been it's been nice to be able to be available for her for uh you know for her getting through some of the different phases of this uh COVID scenario absolutely yeah are you spending now most of your uh, time in Canada or are you still bouncing back and forth between Canada and Singapore um yeah I've been in Singapore the last 10 years and I yeah. felt that during COVID, it would be quite restrictive mm. um, to 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 remain there. So uh, I did uh, uh, go to Canada, and I've been spending um, you know most of my time in Canada. And last winter, I spent in uh, Whistler, uh, ski skiing, and there was a good, nice uh, work life balance there. And then I uh, spent uh, uh, the summer in Muskoka, which to me is one of the most beautiful places in the world. So it's mm -hmm. been it's been nice to spend some time there and. And uh, now just looking to actually just kind of get back on the road a little bit and, and enjoy some, some of my awesome. friendships so talk, abroad. Talking about being on the road and putting boots on the ground, uh, something that I haven't mentioned in the intro that I believe it is worth uh, highlighting very strongly is the fact that uh, you have been contributing and you spent two to three months, uh, you know, provided that COVID uh, allows that to happen again and again, uh, you contribute with Destiny Rescue. And, uh, you know, you have been in the front lines as an undercover operative agent. And uh, your, I guess, goal, mission, your contribution was getting girls out of the sex trade, tra uh, sex trafficking. And uh, let me read this quote for you. And let me know what comes to mind. We cannot do everything, but we can do something. And that something changes everything. You know, um, I, I don't know, back in uh, 2010 or 2011, I was on a uh, trip to to Thailand and we toured orphanages in the upper five provinces and we started to get a little bit more in depth and understanding uh, some of the dynamics of what goes on there with some of these girls' uh, lives. And really, when when you really take a close look at it, these, these poor young ladies are uh, dying and an emotional death and a physical death and they yeah. really then they really lose all hope. Um, and, and, you know, when people want to make change or change the world, really, it's, 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 there are some uh, that just have to change one life at a time. So this really, uh, you know, captured my heart at, uh, you know, at the time. And, 
and I figured something has to be done. And so I connected with Destiny Rescue, started to correspond with some of the, the operatives. I went and I visited a number of their operations throughout uh, the world and, and uh, their head office in, 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 uh, down in uh, Chiang Rai. And, um, and so I was a financial supporter for a while. And then um, there was a point in time where I just, I had time on my hands and I said, let's, you know, let's get, let's get in the streets. So I, I, uh, uh, so they, so, so they start you out just kind of with small tasks mm -hmm. and, uh, then over time then they train you up and then over time, uh, you become really quite involved, uh, in the, you know, in, in the operations and various operations that can, you know, largely depend on you, or they can, you know, really make use of a Caucasian guy. And so, uh, before I knew it, I was I was really quite quite involved, and you get into very uncomfortable situations, very dangerous situations. Every time you you get into a, a truck to to go on a whether it's surveillance or raid and rescue ops, you never know if it's a one way one way ticket. Right. And that's some of the most yeah. most some of the or some of the most anxious times is uh, when you just start speculating on all of the different scenarios that could play out and preparing yourself mentally for all of the scenarios that could play out and um and 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 understanding your teammates and the dynamics of your teammates and so it was it's it's really it's really quite intensive but but uh it's it's rewarding nonetheless you know um i think a lot of people get into trading because they think it's gonna fill a hole yeah. uh in their in their heart or in their life or, or a hole that they don't even know exists and 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 what they what a lot of people fail to understand is it's in it is in, in in helping other people, an investment in other people that that fills these holes. Because when you when you take time to invest in another person, yeah. it stays with them forever, mm -hmm. right? It's not it's not transient. When you buy you buy a car, it's transient. Mm -hmm. You know, you have a you, you win a medal, it's transient. It's here today, gone tomorrow. So you try to to work towards things that are to enhance the lives of others, and and that stays with that person forever. And it makes a mark on that person forever. Yeah, it's so beautifully put. And uh, as we were talking about this uh, topic very briefly uh, off, off the, the recording, I said to you, and something that I completely agree, sometimes it does take uh, taking our attention, our focus outside of trading and into more serious matters to really put things into perspective. And... Uh, Many people become too obsessed with trading, and that's the one and only thing that matters to them. And uh, by, I believe that once you reach a level of threshold where you've got a shelter and then you've got food on the table, uh, an extra number of digits on your account is not going to make that much of a difference. But having a meaningful impact and fulfilling and rewarding that is definitely what what's going to be a major investment in your joy in your happiness and in making other people's life better so uh, kudos to you and i just wanted to highlight this because people understand the type of person that i have in front of me and what a massive heart you got so thanks you. Well, thank you for sharing that uh, thanks you um, if i can make just one point um one one thing about uh the pursuit of trading that is uh, overlooked is that one needs to, based on their own uniqueness, they need to figure out strategies in order to balance the the, the trading, the investment of time, the the periods of intensity versus the periods of passivity, yeah. and and balancing uh, other aspects of life into your overall life because you have to allow the brain to process the information and allow the subconscious to go to work so that the next time you go into a testing mode or you know, research mode or real analytical mode that your brain has had an opportunity to sort out the information so that you can come out, so you come in back to the charts on a, on a new level. Yeah. Okay. That, that's actually a, you know, something that one should be, thing that it should be consciously employed in your, in your development. Yeah, perfect. Now, um, it is often said that whenever we put together a trading plan, a trading plan that has to be unique based off our own experiences, observations, experimentations, and something that becomes a directive for you to actually understand your actions as a trader, uh, it is a powerful question to be asked why we trade. Now, if you actually had to dig deep and get into, under the hood as to 
what does trading represent to you? What fuels your interest or what did fuel your interest in the first place back in the old days uh, on becoming interested in trading the financial markets, distilling market information and passing on this knowledge to others? What, what is it really, what is it ticking for you? What, what's the driving force? Yeah, um, you, know, you know, it's a good question because when we, you know, when we choose an activity, so let's say, you know, sport, uh, why do I do the sport? Well, mm. because I want to, you know, I want to fully utilize my skills and I would like to, I would like to win, right? <clears throat> and, um, but what we overlook is, because you don't know what you don't know. And what we overlook is the uh, engagement of the process. And, and all of a sudden, we're faced with all of these things we didn't necessarily account for. We knew generally what it would involve, but uh, to what extent we didn't know. So, so there, there's, you know, there is that. But um, so when it comes to to uh, trading as a pursuit, uh, for for me personally, it was, you know, when I was in sport, I was, you know, call it a, call it a leader, and um, and I just remember. You know, no matter who you are and where you're at in life, you, I would say most people really want to be fully utilized or have their skills fully utilized. Um, they may feel underappreciated and underutilized in their workplace. And I think that trading gives one an opportunity to, to really uh, be what somebody believes they can be. Um, usually in trading, when they start out, they're actually uh, not as equipped as they think they are. And so they, mm -hmm. because the money has a whole different emotional dynamic that, that causes us to do things that you wouldn't otherwise do. But I think for trading, it's a matter of being able to take your own uh, uniqueness into your own hands and being, and being fully responsible for the manner in, in which you execute. And, and uh, because one typically thinks that, well, if it is left to me, then I can do it much, you know, I can, I can do this much better than I could uh, my job at my workplace where I have some limitations on my, on my, my abilities because I have to comply with the system or I've got a certain type of manager or boss. And, and so this just gives them the liberty and freedom to exercise their own free will. And, but, but what people fail to recognize is that there are a lot of other things that go along with it because all of a sudden you're looking at yourself in the mirror and, and, and it, it starts to expose um, that which you're, you know, that which you're not um, and that which you have to um, call it, you know, call it work on. But, you know, on that subject is, um, is because uh, uh, like our focus, we know that one cannot really succeed in trading until you become a, a fully equipped independent thinker. So the goal should be to be an independent thinker and, and engage in the process that is going to take you to become a full independent thinker. It doesn't mean you're no longer drawing on others' resources or information to enhance that, that uniqueness and optimizing your, your, your uniqueness. Um, but but you know, in that process, you have to take a lot of responsibility for your actions, and the market is going to show you, really, you know, sh show you who you are within, and and uh, and and you have to, you really have to take on that task because what you know in trading, uh, let's let's say that because everybody gravitates towards something different, and then they want to take that, and 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 and. Um, and create their own model. I always say, because you mentioned trading model earlier, hmm. um, a trading model isn't something that uh, you, you pull off the internet or you just go and you start writing it down. A trading model starts by taking all of the pieces uh, and focusing on each individual piece and watching how it comes together as you slowly refine your parameters, your, your risk modeling, and you slowly start to build the relationship with the market that becomes uniquely your own. And, and the more you, 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 you intently engage on very specifics in the market, the more you're building a relationship with that component of the market. And what's important about this is that I can give, I can give 10 
different people the same exercises to conduct, but they're all going to interpret it differently. But what is important is making your brain available to build a relationship with that aspect of price behavior, because the uniqueness of your brain will optimize it for you. And, and whereas somebody else, they can optimize it differently. They can, they can use it as a, as a secondary uh, market dynamic or as, as a primary market dynamic. It all depends on how you interpret it and where it fits within your unique brain. So the, the goal is to, is to marry mm -hmm. the market with your unique brain as you find your niche and your model your model evolves from that. It's not something you don't start with a model and work your way up towards. You actually you, you, you have to actually break it down into multiple pieces and then work your way up. So if I can use a, you know an example of uh, the pieces of the whole is if you take a hundred meter sprinter uh, who has to you know run from point A to point B fast. Well, this gets broken down. So they have they have uh, strength training. In the strength training, there are multiple dimensions of strength training, so improving various, various aspects of strength. You have plyometrics, and there's a range of plyometrics you can do. You can, you've got your, your, your mobility, um, and you've got your speed work. Uh, you've got your health to look after, your, your physical health, your, your, your nutritional uh, health. So there are multiple components, each of which you have to become an expert in. Yep. And then when you stand at the starting line of the 100 meters, you are you are broad based, fully equipped to run from point A to B as fast as you possibly are capable. And and, and trading is, is the same way. You have to build that foundation in order to to really uh, build and refine the model so that you uh, always have something, always have the foundation there so that when you make big mistakes or start going down the wrong path, you can identify uh, where it's coming from. Yeah, it's a great way to put it. It's like do all the, the accessory work targeting each and every category, but at some point you also got to aggregate all this knowledge that you've uh, acquired, put it together, because at the end of the day, when it comes to trading and being in the trenches, pressing buy and sell, all that has to come together. All these uh, skills that you've been building, like whenever you go through the sprint 100 meters, you're going to have to uh, tap into all these combined skills at once, but it does pay off aiming and targeting each and every puzzle or category on its own, because then you can start to distill and identify weak points, what you need to improve on and whatnot. And I think that's uh, personally for me, whenever I do CrossFit and we break down into strength pieces and then mobility, flexibility, uh, lifting, but then when it comes to the workout, we need to actually show up and do whatever it is that we uh, are task and uh, whatever is the, the task at hand, got to do it at the best of our ability. So with trading pretty much is the same, right? You can partition yes. each and every category, understanding, yes. uh, you know, analytics, your, your psychology and within analytics, obviously there's going to be different components. And then when it comes to, you know, pressing the bottom, that's where everything comes together. That, that, that's right. And that's, and we can get into some of that when we cover some of the technicals yes. in terms of how yeah. all that works and how yeah. it becomes aggregated into, into one. We'll yes. touch that in a second. Now, I want to focus on the, the uniqueness of your teaching. I've gone through forexpeaceami.com, and just like in trading, you have to accumulate many, many trades for you to start gaining credibility on a method that is either going to be working or not. Uh, you've gathered many reviews, and your rating is one of the highest that I've seen, meaning that it is, it is a testament of the quality of the education that you provide. What do you think makes you as an educator so highly regarded by your students? Um, I don't know. I haven't checked Forex Peace Army in quite a few years, but <laughs> I, I, I just did this morning and you maintain those high ranks. So, okay. Um, you know, I, I because our, our, our membership's not huge. So, I have the opportunity to to really spend the necessary time uh, with each individual. So, uh, first of all, um, I really like to try to deliver the highest quality and and try to over deliver. Um, but I think when somebody comes into Pro Traders Club, I think that the way the information is is shared is that 
See, in Fort Traders Club, we'll have people that are interested in, in algorithmic trading, but they want to broaden their understanding of certain aspects of price behavior. So they'll mm -hmm. come in there and they'll kind of pick apart what it is that they may find interesting that may uh, help them with some of the parameters that they put into their algorithms. And people who are just different types of traders who just want to, you know, maybe broaden their understanding. And then you have those who really, really connect with um, price behavior, price relationships, and that type of market structure because it really gets into considerable depth. Mm -hmm. And and I think they I think they get what they what they look for. You know, nobody ever really leaves saying they they you know it wasn't what they expected. Um, really, uh, so. And then also we have like, you know, we've got a question and answer uh, section where when you send me your question uh, on written on a chart with some er with some arrows and some notations, I actually, I will answer the question. Uh, but because at any time I'm ever asked a question in the foreign, you know, concerning trading, uh, I typically find myself talking to one person and the audience should be larger. So what I do is I just take the one question and, and I, I take, the opportunity to use it as a teaching opportunity. And I'll, I'll run from anywhere from 15 minutes to 30 minutes, just covering that one dimension. Cause a lot of people don't even really quite know what they're asking when they ask a question. So we contextualize it and then really get into the nitty gritty. So I think they feel that that's very, you know, very personal. And uh, most people in their trading, they get to this point where they're maybe stuck and, and they, they, you know, they can see it or they just haven't, you know, they, they just kind of get to that that point at which they they're 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 trying to get through this barrier. So um, you know, and if it warrants a phone call, then then I'll I'll make a phone call, right? So we we really want people to to gain the fullness of the experience and and use Pro Traders Club as as a means through which they will pass on becoming a, a full time trader. We're not you know we're not something that you should uh, rely on. We're not a copy me system. Mm -hmm. uh, but simply a means means where you will acquire information and to, to and and move on to becoming an independent thinking trader. Yeah, and over the over the years, have you been able to educate people to the point that you can now delegate to your students part of the teaching that you used to do, and that helps you to I guess take the the foot off the gas pedal a little bit and delegating more as opposed to being as active as you used to be a few years ago. Um, you know, one of the reasons why we've remained fairly boutique is because I like to I like to really it to come from me because mm -hmm. the the experience that I have I know is is really quite uh, quite uh, you know intense and quite rich. Yeah, hard and to replace so that. I like to I like to communicate it and share it myself. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not concerned with large memberships. Uh, I do have another individual who uh, I have mentored who trades quite well, and he's he's a contributor. Um, and he's got his own way. And, and what's nice about having him there is, is how he has taken the information and uh, formulate it to his own uniqueness yeah. and, and focuses on a specific area. Um, you know, while it's consistent with my mm -hmm. content, it, it has his own uniqueness, of course. Uh, so, so I do have another, another contributor in there as well that people really, really seem to appreciate his content. Yeah. Now, let's tackle a very important question, and that is, what do you think would be the ideal development process of a trader? You tend to emphasize a lot in your website, and you've already touched a couple of times through this conversation, that ultimately, uh, a trader needs to become an independent thinker. Is that your end goal as a mentor, that they actually pick as much as possible in terms of knowledge, and ultimately, that uh, serves them uh, into finding their true persona and their true profile as a trader. Um, you know, again, it's it's you know it's this process where if I were to share information um, conceptually, mm. uh, you know, that's just in concept, and people might say, you know, wow, that that makes sense. It looks very interesting. I think I'll try that. Then they pull up their charts and they say. Uh, I don't know where to start. I, I don't even know, you know, how to, what to look for, what he was just saying, right? So, so there's, there's that, that point of just kind of making that original connection, starting out with small tasks. And, uh, you know, the, the typically like people that are pro traders club members, typically they've been around, you know, they've gone through what we call the exploratory phase where, uh, they've just discovered a lot of different aspects about trading, and then they, you know, perhaps decided 
that they want to just see if they connect, see a little bit more if they connect with this type of content. Mm -hmm. and, and that's fair enough because every every trader trades differently. There are there are there are virtually, you know, for every trader there is, there's a different approach. And and if it works, it works. And that's and, and to me, that's great. So um uh what we try to do is is again, we take the we take the small pieces and we we establish a level of engagement in the market so that they can start a relationship with specific aspects of price behavior. But then as you slowly build that out, then then let's say you're 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 working on you know a single price behavior and you're trying to connect with it and understand it, then uh, you introduce a second one. Well, those two actually work together as well, right? So there's relationship between the two price behaviors as a part of the whole. And as you build out your profile, you slowly start to gravitate toward um, behaviors that are most consistent that end up leading into a trade that goes into your trading trading uh, uh, arsenal, mm -hmm. all right? And ones that you find that have a high rate of consistency. Mm -hmm. But what's, you know, what's more important about identifying a price behavior or a market scenario that uh, retains a, uh, uh, a high probability of playing out favorably is the fact that you understand it at, at its greatest depths. And, and so that you can man, you can, you can allocate the risk to it and then manage it uh, accordingly. So, uh, and, you know, and in that whole process, you're actually really developing uh, a relationship with, with price and with the market and, and you're developing a relationship with your trading persona. <clears throat> because, uh, you know, back when I was, back when I was bobsledding, um, what was important about sport was that every time you, you step up to the line in a World Cup race, you are, you are putting yourself into a vulnerable position and you're taking your brain to a place it's never ultimately gone before, right? You're engaging in a new experience that, and that experience, the greater level of understanding of what you're about to engage in, when you have that experience, the more you can extract from it. So, and, to, and, and, and the more you take your brain to where it's never been gone before while understanding where it was beforehand, the more you are going to capture from that experience. So, so this is why I, um, if you've seen some of my videos, you may hear me say, uh, in, in, in when, while you're learning the aspects of, of market structure and price behavior and price relationships, um, you need to take your brain to where it's been, where it's never gone before. You, you could say uh, that you're taking your brain into new all-time highs, right? Once, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And the thing about trading is it'll take it to new all-time lows as well. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you've got to be prepared for that. But it's actually as long as it's a structured experience, yeah, yeah. and it has value, right? But yeah. if it's a random experience, mm -hmm. it's not going to have the same value and you'll probably go back out and you'll probably uh, create the same mistake to the same magnitude. Uh, right? <laughs> so, uh, but that, that's right. So, you know, take, and, and, and this is something that needs to be, you know, adapted. Like when I, when I speak to athletes, um, they, they may have a certain you know, trading regime. Mm -hmm. And so I'll say, okay, well, try, try this for a six week period and see how it blends with the other training that you're doing and see if you find that your body is more responsive under, you know, under certain scenarios. So you have to go through that experimental phase to just to take your brain there so that your body knows, yes, it kind of worked or this is parts of it worked or it didn't work at all. Right. And, and so you, you've got to go there uh, and, and it's important to, to, to go there in a structured manner, just like the same way as you're developing your trading. Uh, you have to maintain structure while you are, you know, building your competency in your in your trading regime. Yeah, I gotta say that I well, no, I suppose is an assumption that when you started off uh, trading financial markets after your career as a uh, Bob uh, Bob Slate uh, sportsman. Um, you probably had a head start because of the level and the degree of discipline, dedication, uh, you know, pay attention to small details and how that obviously resonates and aligns with trading as well. 
um, do you do you believe that that has been a one of the uh, major advantages that you had right from the get go, having experienced the sport of bobsled and then transitioning into trading, and how that has built up a robust discipline ethic within you? You know, uh, it was interesting because I actually started. I I I, uh, I was interested in the financial markets from my from my you know late teens and early twenties. And, uh, you know, when I would read periodicals and I would, you know, go to the newspaper and check out the prices from day to day and, okay. and watch certain stocks. And, and at that time, I had some friends that were, you know, becoming stockbrokers, they were called at the mm -hmm. time. And, and so I took a strong interest in it. Then I took the Canadian securities course after my first Olympics. And, and so, so I did have an acquaintance with the financial markets, but in no uh, you know, in no way did I understand um, uh, what trading would involve, really. So when I retired from sport, you know, we had the NASDAQ bubble going on. And so you get in there and you trade a few stocks and and you start to gain these experiences. And, and really, um, I when I left sport, I thought, yes, I have an advantage in the sense that I'm willing to work hard. I'm disciplined. Uh, you know, I can, you know, do what's required of me to succeed. But I did not really anticipate how that would transfer into trading until I started getting into the depths of trading. Mm -hmm. and, and I didn't think of it in that way in terms of I've got this and I can transfer it into this. I just figured I'm willing to do the work. But I didn't know what the work was. Right. So so in the late 90s, um, and I as I was you know, trading in the in this, this Nasdaq bubble, um, then I started to get a taste for what trading involved. Um, and then when the foreign exchange market opened, then that's when my engagement really intensified. And and at that point, it was really a matter of, of identifying uh, the psychology and the 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 the, um, uh, the intensity uh, and the demand on your on your psychology how I was prepared for it yeah. and that I just simply needed to adapt it to the trading environment and, and engage in the same processes that I did in sport because sport was all about process um, you know every everything was process every uh, dimension of your your physical preparation to the equipment uh, to a race. I, I knew exactly how I needed to feel uh, like one week out before a World Cup race and start preparing myself mentally for that track, for all of the details on that track, all of the feelings I had internalized. And as you move closer toward the moment that you step on the line for the race, you have, you know exactly where you need to be and because everything is internalized. And so it was that aspect that one day I just thought, wow, this is this is you know just like trading, um, and and or sorry, just like uh, bobsledding, and and uh, that really accelerated my process. But you know, uh, I don't think one should say, well, you know, he was an Olympic uh, bobsledder. Um, I think that everybody has gone through a process uh, of succeeding or becoming an expert at something, right? And and. Uh, I think that that everybody has the reference points that can be adapted into trading. Now, there's a couple of other dynamics. There is one is you know you may become an expert at something that you that that is in alignment with gifts that you have with your natural skill set, or you may be an expert at something that is not necessarily within your skill set, but you worked hard to get there and you were a student of the game and you've managed to execute with excellence. So, so that part does need to be understood. The great thing about trading is that you can, you can marry uh, your study of the market into your own uniqueness and optimize your uniqueness, right? You know, this, this, this old adage about, uh, I need to work on my, on my weaknesses. Uh, trading is more about drawing on your strengths and focusing in on the areas where you're strong, you have you have a, a high level of competency and capability. And most people that I find in trading is that most people underestimate their level of competency in certain areas. And so you can have a level of competency over here, mm -hmm. and then you may have the 
uh, technical demands over here in terms of understanding the fundamentals or you know a trading approach over mm -hmm. here, but you've slowly got to bring those two together. So as you are building your um, if this is if this is your competency level, whether you're taking a technical approach or fundamental or algorithmic, whatever it might be, if this is your the, the, the model that you are developing and this is your level of competency, you need to these need to grow together. Mm. They need to grow and, 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 and commingle and develop together. You can't you know, you can, one can't be in front of the other. And this is where traders go uh, go wrong is that th I see a lot of traders, they will grow these two components, the brain, you know, the mind and the model, they'll grow them together. And then one day they decide they're going to take an excessive amount of risk on a trade. And then one trade, then two trades, then three trades. And then, you know, maybe they were trading it live and, and the account goes bad. And then what traders will do is they'll blame it on the model. They won't blame it on the decision that they made to move beyond their their risk parameters that they know to be true um, they'll blame it on the model then they'll start over they'll take what their friend is doing they'll try something something random off the internet and try to integrate it and but that's not the problem the problem is over here and is being ignored right so so um uh just kind of you know tying it back in is is these are errancies that 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 we all make and 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 um you know, you really want to try to develop a model that is in alignment with your with your core strengths. Yeah, perfect. Well put. Now you talk about adaptation, and I know that you've been a proponent of trading primarily forex. Uh, at this point in time, are you still as active trading the forex market, or have you expanded your focus <clears throat> into other markets as volatility has been decreasing over time in the forex? We know that central banks are in a race to the bottom, um, uh, central bank monetary policy divergences uh, yes. used to you know, create long lasting trends. Remember long are the days where the, the Aussie US dollar would go from 60 cents to 1.10, 1.20. Now it seems like everything is much more compressed. How your approach has changed over time in terms of both your trading style and the markets that you're trading? So, um... First of all, on the trading style, because we use we use the fractal nature of price. So, um, in other words, a price behavior that I identify on a one minute chart or five minute chart, um, from the standpoint of uh, price volatility, liquidity, um, seeking liquidity, um, the 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 price behaviors are the same as they would be on a daily chart. Uh, you know, I could take a fifteen minute chart and a daily chart and, and put it in front of one. And talk about the nature of price dynamics, and you wouldn't know the difference whether it's you know a fifteen or a daily. Um, so the my approach is very scalable because the function of liquidity is pretty consistent mm -hmm. um, among all asset classes, while each individual asset has its own unique dynamics. So it's it's very scalable. Now um, back to your question concerning the changes in volatility. Yes. Yeah. So the early 2000s was the heyday, right? Mm. So the euro dollar was trading in ranges of, you know, 100, 120 pips a day, pound dollar, 140 to 180 pips a day. It was great. We had wide, you know, we had wide interest rate differentials. We had the carry trade going on. We could borrow the yen and move it into Aussie. And, and so the market dynamics were, were very favorable, but you did need to have a risk profile that, that accommodated that, that heightened volatility. And as well, liquidity was a little bit different at the time now. The, the, there's, there's a lot more liquidity in the market. The, the means by which you access liquidity has, um, you know, a, a, has changed as well and improved, mm -hmm. of course. So, so all of these combined factors have changed the nature and, and of course the, 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 the race to zero in interest rates. This has all changed volatility in the market. So now, now we're in a situation where FX volatility is, is lower, uh, much lower. And um, so you know, I, I'm trying to trade the more volatile pairs. So pound dollar is very trade trading friendly. Mm. So what happens is as a result, because of the, the, the intraday moves or intra-week moves, um, what's happened is, is I found that my hold times are longer because price can move slower 
and price moves a little bit less than it used to. So the hold times are longer, short-term trades are for less, um, you know, less pips. Um, it's very good from a risk stand management standpoint. Uh, it's very favorable because it's low risk, low volatility, low, low risk. Um, low risk in the sense that um, uh, how much room you give the market to breathe. Your risk is your risk. So you just, of course, you just adjust your position to size and your risk to the dynamics and the, and the volatility of the market. So that uh, that shouldn't change. But as far as, you know, really having a grasp on the price behavior, the low volatility has actually become much more favorable. And algorithms have also introduced a manner of efficiency in the market that I have found to be very favorable for, for foreign exchange. So, um, so again, to your point that uh, yes, the FX market volatility has dropped off um, quite a bit um, to the extent where at one time I did say, why would I trade anything else? I love FX, it's working for me to the point where now I'm, <laughs> I'm trading more, you know, a few more stocks um, I'm trading gold more, okay. Um, because gold volatility is is you know is fantastic, and um, I'm trading the S and P uh, a lot more. Uh, so because the S and P volatility is great, it's just again it's the the uh, you know really tightening up the risk on on uh, on the S and P uh, e minis. It can be quite dynamic, you know, movement. So you have to. It's kind of like the the old days of the pound dollar. Uh, so yes, I have um, diversified out, and I'm also I'm engaging uh, on, a, on a percentage of time allocation uh, basis, engaging less in highly intensive short term trades, and my hold times tend to be a little bit a little bit longer, um, and 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 a lot of trades I will take with the openness to this could be a very short hold or I could actually sit on this trade for for a while or in part for a while so um, sorry maybe I'm talking too much <laughs> no no not at all I just want to mention that the the painting that you see behind me this represents fractals the trade yes and to me fractals are very important in the market it's you know a fractal can be understood as a series of line, as, as a series of lines but also any shape or object that repeats itself so in trading extrapolating that to trading obviously is the repetitious price behavior that occurs at certain points or pockets of liquidity and so forth and talking yes. about liquidity and the price behavior i'd like to invite you if you don't mind to share your screen and let's just touch a bit on your trading models i am very fascinated about how you unpack price action based on the time of the day volatility fractals support and resistance news and how you tend to focus on also order flow and, and, and whenever a price gets into, let's just say, a point of uh, liquidity activation, because there's going to be a concentration of liquidity at, yes. certain, at certain areas, you have dedicated most of your work in uh, interpreting what price does at certain areas of liquidity where there's going to be a higher audience to send the price either in yes. one direction or in another. So let's just call it a decision point in the market, right? Yes. And uh, I would absolutely love that the audience gets a bit of a taste on how you trade, your models, and so forth. If you want to share your screen, you, you just have to click on the bottom panel. There is a button that uh, says share screen. It's like yeah, a... Let me make sure I've got that screen up there. Okay. Perfect. You just got to then select the screen yeah. that you want to capture, and uh, we'll be good to go. Share this one. Great. I can see a volume profile, a moving average, and the price itself. That moving average, actually, you know, about more than 15 years ago, this is a 34 EMA, and, and we, we never use it, and I never refer to it. There's not one place in the video where I ever refer to it, but it, it was on my templates, and I just kept it on my templates, just kind of like for laughs and for for something to look at and um, I never really referred to it, but most of my charts you'll find are pretty clean, are pretty clean. Yeah. Uh, but um, so let's just maybe do uh, some, some conceptual uh, discussion first, and then we can, we can, uh, can you see my marker there? Yeah, I can see your marker. Yeah. Okay. 
So first of all, let's maybe just talk a little bit about the uh, the fractal nature of price, and then we can talk a little bit about liquidity, mm -hmm. um, and and then sort of just some of the uh, foundational elements of of my model. So great. If if you look at um, you know if you look at a price swing like this. So when we talk about fractal nature, we're talking about patterns of self similarity. Uh, uh, um, similar to the whole. Hmm. So in other words, if this is a price swing, and if I were to take a snapshot of this price swing over here and I were to magnify it, you would see a pattern that looks something like this. So all of the characteristics that bear out in this price swing, and there are about 10 to 15 core characteristics that we really look at. Hmm. Um, so there's there's characteristics and then there's there's liquidity and volatility as a function of available liquidity, which is critically, critically important to understand. Volatility is a function of available liquidity. So, um, so now if we were to take um, this, a snapshot of this, and we were to magnify it, then we would see the same types of characteristics bear out in that micro component of the price swing. So this is fractal nature. All right, so when we see uh, price behavior like this, this is a five minute chart. We see price behavior like this. Um, it is a part of the whole and similar to the whole. This, mm -hmm. is why the, this is why the model and understanding of price behavior is scalable because the price behaviors we see here are the same types of price behavior in character that will play out on a higher time frame. So the question is, uh, you know, how do we, how do we, uh, in, in, how do we understand the specific price behavior? First of all, what are the specific price behaviors, and how do we gain to under, How do we, we we go through a process of understanding them? I'm not really going to get into the different types of price behaviors, mm -hmm. but I want to shift it over a little bit now from uh, because when the term fractal is used, um, it's used in many different ways. And we're talking about fractal geometry. Uh, call it geometry in the physical sense when we're looking at charts, but fractal nature mm -hmm. uh, plays out in human beings, groups of human beings, uh, communities of human beings, uh, um, countries of human beings, and human beings in the marketplace. We all have similar characteristics that we see play out in the marketplace, and we can see them in price. So let's, um, so now that we understand sort of the, the, the way in which we are interpreting fractal nature of the market, let's just talk a little bit about liquidity. So um, again, just talking about it uh, from a purely call it theoretical standpoint, if we have a, um, if we have a price range and this price range can be represented on uh, any time frame. So when you have a price range, you'll usually see price ranging like this, and it will go from one dealing range to the next, to the next. So for example, you'll notice, this is obviously the off market hours, but I just want to show you this as an example. Mm -hmm. You'll notice you spend a certain amount of time in the range and then a very much shorter percentage of the time that price is moving out. So you can see here, if you look at the bodies here, the core area of liquidity, you spend four times as much time moving sideways as you do price moving out. And this is a very, you know, this is a very consistent pattern mm -hmm. throughout, throughout, you know, um, the nature of markets. So, um, so if we're in what we refer to as a low liquidity state, so you've got volume coming in, a balance of volume on both sides. And when price, the longer it goes, the more price is in a low liquidity state, but the longer this goes, Typically, we are seeing, and, and, and just um, if I can make a note, um, we did a study on, on, uh, on volume price relationships. And because, uh, because it is said that, you know, you can't, there, there is no true representation of the entire volume in the foreign exchange marketplace at any given time. But we did uh, measure uh, volume based on based on 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 trade transactions mm -hmm. on on multiple uh entities and we found that it is highly consistent with 
uh, highly consistent representation of overall volume. So within yeah. within a range, you know, within a range of about the upper 20, 20th percentile. Yeah. Uh, we studied this. So so whatever volume profile you see over here um, is fairly, fairly consistent. Mm -hmm. um, and consistent enough that you can use it as a pretty consistent parameter of understanding the level of volume in any in certain areas. So, so um, as just as I watch, as a, as a side note, as a sideshow, um, as we watch this euro dollar move lower, I, I think you'll probably see a little bit of a reaction here at 116, somewhere down around here, and price draw maybe back up here to 1608 or 1610. So we'll we'll just look at that uh, for the time being. But um, sorry, I just erased my. So as price moves into this low liquidity state, you can usually fraction this out. And when pr the longer price goes, the more liquidity is drawing away from the market, right? So the longer it stabilizes, the more liquidity is drawing away from the market. So you can see um, here, for example, as, as price um, moves sideways right here, Maybe not the best example, but after price swept the book right here, it goes into this low liquidity state. So it's a small body and then price starts to move from there. That's a fairly consistent behavior. So you see right here, we get into this small body and price moves from there. So the reason why I point that out is that is when the point at which liquidity is getting lighter and lighter, typically as price moves sideways. So the the less liquid the environment. So maybe over here, when price was moving, you had a lot of liquidity within close proximity to price, a lot of liquidity flowing, uh, flowing on both sides of the market. But as price consolidates and moves sideways, the, the state of liquidity is getting uh, lighter and lighter. So, so it may be thick here, thicker here, thick here. Um, but the longer this goes, the thinner it gets. So mm -hmm. if it's thin in close proximity to the market, it's usually pretty thin the more distal you are to the market until you hit a point where there may be a little bit of enrichment of liquidity. And these are these are liquidity pooling areas where we identify the potential for a price response or a little bit of volatility. And this can be represented by you know any 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 number of types of levels. I won't get into at the moment, but um, but this is an area where we would identify uh, some potential liquidity has has and some inventories have have built up. Yeah. So when price is in a low liquidity state, you've got you know you've got some fairly consistent volume coming in on both sides, and what happens is is you often find that there's a little fraction of a weak spot uh, on one side of the market, and if you've got a little bit of volume coming in place of that weak spot in the market depth, then, um, and it's not something you can really visually see by looking at a level, you know, at a, at a, at a, at a volume depth chart. It's something you see more in price behavior than you see uh, um, visually. However, um, it does exist. And what happens is you'll see a little bit of a surge of volume against that weak spot. And so, uh, so what has to happen? Price, price has to find liquidity. So it's, you know, it's referred to as price discovery or price has to find liquidity. So as it's searching for liquidity, it's got to go up this chain, right? And so there might be a little bit of a volume surge at first, but then you'll start to see it's got to move up this chain to fill the order. So what happens is um, that most liquidity representation that you see, so if you're looking at, um, I should have pulled up a, pulled up a trade ticket, I don't have one immediately available, but um, uh, uh, when you see, if you're looking at at volume depth and and uh, uh, the most of liquidity in the volume depth is fake. Uh, the reason why it's fake is because and this is just kind of I'm just kind of going backwards a little bit here, just to give you a little bit of you know foundational yep. um, inf information. The reason why is because if this is the broker that you, uh, sorry, um, th if this broker has an order that comes in, call it, um, you know, call it 50 million, they are going to farm out that liquidity. They're going to send it out to 
those who they have you know credit lines with and who have they have relationship with and who have liquidity uh, uh, provisions with. So they will send that order out to multiple entities. And what happens is, is if it gets picked up by this entity right here, mm -hmm. then if it gets picked up at you know almost the exact same time as another entity, then uh, this is when you have the last look scenario that potentially could play out where your order gets rejected because the um, the entity has been given uh, uh, they 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 use last look practice in order to give themselves the opportunity to accept or reject the order. Um, and so once this order is taken, then this one, these ones immediately disappear, right? right? So if you're looking at the depth chart over here and all of a sudden you see that liquidity is gone and the, the nature of the depth of liquidity changes, that's because this one has taken that liquidity away. So most, so most of this liquidity is, is, is fake because uh, a liquidity provider will, will send out their quotes to you know, 20 or 25 different providers. Mm -hmm. Now, what happens here is, is um, let's call it, uh, you know, this type of scenario right here is playing out here where liquidity gets very thin, um, a, a volume surge comes in on one side, and, and it can be a very real volume surge in the sense that there's follow-up. So it's got a fine price. So what happens is as price moves out of this range, yep. it's, it's actually moving into a whole new state of liquidity, uh, a new environment of liquidity. So the price behaviors change. And the, the algorithms at the major financial institutions, uh, they, they know that this change occurs and they adjust their, they adjust their quotes uh, accordingly. Right. So they, they create a situation where, because they don't want to get clipped on the buy and the sell and then offer one for, you know, higher or lower than they should and then get, get caught in between. So um, having to pay for, for the difference. So they create, um, they create a price quotation uh, uh, means that's going to facilitate their own needs because it's all, it's all about the money, right? So that's going to change how price moves. So as price moves, it creates this price chasing kind of uh, environment and, and the spreads will, will just take these little ticks wider and narrower, wider and narrow. The spreads will, will change, but it's actually drawing price up. So as the higher price moves in one move, the weaker it gets. So this creates a new scenario. So as you see price breaking out, price will rise and you'll typically see these You'll typically see that these candles are a little bit more lengthy, of course, than the candles down in this range. And sometimes you'll see a really long one at the start, or sometimes it may build up. And then as you get towards the end, they get longer. The reason why they get longer is because they've got to find, they've got to go further to find liquidity. So, so um, you'll see just like if you look at this candle right here, you will see that it is longer than the base candle. The next one, price comes back, picks up liquidity at the breakout point because of this, this right here represents the new state of liquidity. This little area right here, price comes back, picks it up. And then look how far it has to move to pick up liquidity. I mean, we're, we're splitting hairs here, but uh, that's how far it had to move uh, just to find price. So that means the more it moves, the weaker it gets. So the more subject it is to falling back to pick up liquidity down towards the base or where a pocket of liquidity was left behind. So this, um, these market dynamics, so two things are happening here. One is as price breaks out, you've got the price chasing mechanism in play and the spread of volume gets weaker and weaker and weaker. And just by looking at this long candle right here, you can see that price has to go further to pick up liquidity, which means this environment right here is thin on liquidity. So if that environment is thin on liquidity and price is pushing higher and it reaches an area where there is a potentially a pocket of liquidity, which we can identify by looking at uh, a market structure, then you have got a combination of two things. You've got the strength of the level and you've got the weakness of the move. So that's an area where we anticipate a move off of that level somewhere within 
you know, in, sometimes it's very, very exact. And sometimes if it hasn't been touched in a while, it'll stop sooner in turn. But that's an area where we potentially would, you know, if you're looking at a short term move, you might uh, make a make a trade short or just an area that you identify for informational purposes that will uh, that will help facilitate um, uh, an understanding of what's going on with market dynamics so that when it comes a time where a trade does present itself, uh, you you understand what the construct of liquidity is in this entire area. Okay, so let me just go back and show some uh, physical examples here. Let me just maybe just pop up, up a, a few charts. Yeah, um, for you, Chris, the best representation of a liquidity pool, is it identified through uh, levels of support and resistance, a combination of that plus uh, round numbers, which as we know, they have both psychological power, but at the same time, commercials and big institutions, they tend to utilize these numbers as uh, you know, uh, known pools of liquidity as well. What, what's your take on that? Yes, I, I actually, you know, as simple as it is, I love trading. I love trading the, the round numbers on the, mm -hmm. uh, on most pairs. I mm -hmm. like trading the, the round numbers, you know, 116, 115. And there are, there are of course some rules around that. And some of the rules are the longer the time um, from which, you know, price is now approaching that number to when it last washed through liquidity at that point, uh, that's important because, um, because you have um, knockout options building up in these areas and very, uh, if you understand sort of some of the other instruments that are traded in the foreign exchange market for hedging purposes and a multitude of other uh, purposes, you find an accumulation of liquidity in and around those numbers, yep. as well as some sensitivity based on the algorithms, because most algorithms these days uh, um, um, are sensitive to uh, timings from the last 15 to 30 minutes for short-term efficiency, and then there's some other rules around the, the longer the longer-term algorithms. But anyway, um, so there's a general rule, the longer the time frame from when last price last touched the big number mm -hmm. to the time where it's approaching the big number has more value, okay. Uh, okay, or more, more potential impact. Okay, so now if, call it a level of support or resistance. Now, support and resistance has usually uh, three or four different areas within that support or resistance that can represent more volume or less. So, so, um, uh, so in order to kind of get into the depth of really seeing where that is, it's first, it's good to first identify good clean support resistance and then from there slowly start to work your way into the finer aspects of it. But let's just have a look at some of the, um, you know, some of the dynamics mm -hmm. here. So here you have, um, let's just look at what's happening right now at this moment. So you've got, um, Right here. Okay, let me let me first. There's one thing that I wanted to point out on the previous point yep. that I'll point out now, and yep. that is um, so. Right here, for example, this is a 60 minute chart. Maybe I'll pull up a smaller time frame so we can get a bit of a better view. Um, so this is a 15 minute chart, mm -hmm. and you can see here that uh, price rose, and then we just kind of wicked out right here. And you see this down move right here where price is drifting back into this uh, breakout point. The breakout point is more down here. That's because of the nature of price behavior down here because you see price has come back and fully filled versus here. It's only filling just now. 116 um, row number. Yes. Um, so the so what happened here, you see how price just broke this little swing and then came back and picked up the liquidity right here. Yeah. versus what happened here, we went into a new state, we didn't come back very far, so that usually suggests the move's not over, um, and that you're probably going to, at a later time, come back and fill that, which is now. So, But as price is rising, you see here how price is dropping. Now, the volume, um, so if I were to ask, uh, you know, what happened up here, one mm -hmm. would say, well, they're starting to sell or the sellers are coming into the market. 
that's that's not really a true statement um, at all. And this is something that's very, very important to understand is that this down move is not a function of new sellers coming into the market. There may have been some orders up here that absorbed the buy orders, but you can actually have a uh, price falling because if that were true, okay, if it were true that more sellers were coming in here than there were buyers here, then you would have an increase in volume. And then when price starts to rise, then you've got another increase in volume still. And basically you've got an, a, an infinite increase in volume, right? So volume doesn't work that way. Volume goes in balance. You've all seen volume charts and it goes, it ebbs and flows, right? So this is the ebbing of volume ultimately. And when you, when you really start to understand that this move lower is just simply drawing back into the vacuum of buyers until it hits points of liquidity, then, then that's a very important aspect of trading because when you see price dropping and you actually see that your volume representation is lower, then that usually means that when price comes down here and it's liquidity, you get a little bit of a pop in volume and price will you know, draw back up. So it's just important to understand that this down move mm -hmm. is price drawing back into a weakened, a weakened area. Yeah. All right. And and whereas sometimes it's legitimate selling. So for example, um, once we break through this area, you're probably actually going to see um, even more of a withdrawal of buyers and then an increase in sellers uh, taking it down to the next level. Yeah, Chris, isn't it true that whenever the price reaches a pool of liquidity, let's just say 1.1620, which has represented the top in this up move, uh, for the market to actually move back down, uh, it cannot just be a function of sell limit orders at that point. You need That's to right. actually have actualized order flow. In other words, aggressive sellers that are stepping in, moving the price. Otherwise, if there was just a wall of sell limits, unless... Well, even if the mark, if the buyers are going to be pulling off their orders, there needs to be market orders from the sell side that are going to be taking this price down, right? There's there's typically not a lot at at yeah. That's at why first, you emphasize low volume and and drawing right. like that. Yeah, at first, so you've got weakness coming into this into this area, and so you actually have it's very it's very hollow mm. on buyers on buyers here, particularly. If you see, um, if you just see like a like for example, um, you know this this is off hours, but this is a very very weak move, and these usually get filled uh, when you know when Europe opens up these types of weak moves because the core liquidity is down you know is down here. Um, so just getting back to this point in terms of the shift in volume mm -hmm. is that when we identify a point at which liquidity is pooling, if we see a weak move into that area, it will often absorb, and you'll actually see it absorbing. If you take it down to a smaller time frame, you'll see that price will draw up. And usually what happens is if this is your pool and the point at which you might start to see some price shift, as price starts drawing up, you can usually tell how weak price is because it doesn't quite get all the way to that area because you'll have orders here. Mm -hmm. And then on the periphery, you've got lighter volumes on the periphery. So as soon as it touches that lighter area of volume and responds, then you, 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 it tells you just how weak this move is. So you might wait and see if it tries to get through and tries to get through, and then it'll start to show you that it's trying to get through, but it continues to fail, which suggests that there's a real depletion in the buyers. So this pool means a pool is, is rich. And as price breaks down, then you'll often see the floor will drop out on the buyers. And yes, you will see sellers start to come in yes. at this point. At this point, because once this fractal starts to break down, mm -hmm. the nature of the price delivery, so the way, nature in which the mechanics uh, are delivering price changes, OK? And so then you actually start to see a change in the flows. And usually, you know, usually when price comes back up and refers to that level is often an area where you'll you'll want to you'll want to get in. There's a number of other areas, but that's sort of just one of the areas. Um, and I usually apply this type of um, to usually to longer hold time moves than shorter. Um, 
because there's a because just because of the nature of risk. And so, when, whenever you see this shift in uh, price slash liquidity dynamics, how much of it is influenced by these days algorithm activity as opposed to uh, manual trading? Has it changed a lot the landscape uh, in terms of liquid dynamics and how algos are influencing this dynamics? One, one thing that's been really um, favorable with the with a lot of the, the so not only has there been an introduction of of, of algorithms. Remember, it's important to, to, to always keep in mind the, 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 the broad magnitude of market participants. Yeah. So, yeah. so the short-term algorithmic traders seeking, you know, that are speculating on market and just looking to, to engage in the market for, you know, surely for profit, um, is a fairly small representation, really. Um, but, but they do, they do provide liquidity in the right places. Um, as well, you have the advancement in the technology of the liquidity providers has also made things more efficient and more uh, a little bit more transparent as well. So, for example, I have a um, I have a colleague, a friend of mine that that um, what they do is if this is the bid ask spread, their algorithm identifies when there's a hole in that spread and they offer liquidity just above that area. So if price just pops up, they offer liquidity. And then as price draws back into the range, they're just taking uh, fractions of a pip or a pip or maybe two pips, but they're actually an algorithm providing liquidity to the market, Yep. right? So it's very, it's very interesting. So we've had the lengthy discussions because uh, a lot of how I see the market, they had not considered um, in their trading. And because they surely come, come at it from a mathematical uh, uh, and, and functional uh, uh, standpoint. Mm -hmm. And so this is just one example of how these types of entities are coming into the marketplace, actually making it more fluent and more liquid and, and actually a lot more stable, which is favorable. Uh, we, would, we would prefer stable price versus instable volatility on the shorter term price moves, mm -hmm. right? Because if you're trading short term, you, you just don't want too much noise. And I found that the algorithms have net, there's definitely been a noise reduction, um, you know, in, in the last 20 years, significant noise reduction with the intro of algos. So um, let me just um, pull up, uh, see what's going on here with the, um, with the, uh, so as you see this example here, you see how price was in this low liquidity state right here. This is a five minute chart on the pound dollar. Yep. So you've got this ascending move right here and then price moves into a new state of liquidity, a new price reference points, builds out this price block. Price stabilizes, you can see the, um, the highest to the lows is only a you know, couple pips. But when price breaks out, so there would have been you know, lighter liquidity at this time, price breaks out. And once it stabilizes right here, again, it goes into that, into that mode of price stability. And there would have been uh, an opening right here and price had to pop back and pick up liquidity here and then deeper level right here. So you can see the move picks up liquidity and then it moves higher, even right here. Price goes into a new state of liquidity, comes back, picks up liquidity at this, what we refer to as a clean breaking point. Yep. And um, this is only you know, a short-term time frame. So, and, and again, these are just these are just small pieces of the larger puzzle. Mm. Um, um, that that when we let's say, for example, you were to do, let me just shift gears a little bit here and talk about um, you know, how can we. How can we take a closer look at this? So, what I would suggest is, mm -hmm. um, if you if you do something like this, is um, you take one single price behavior. Um, so, by the way, you can see um, you see when price breaks out here, you see how liquidity is very skinny right here. Well, uh, this area that would make this area right here. Uh, highly open to a nice price response in that area, simply by the magnitude of transactions and liquidity relative to the lack of liquidity in this 
uh, in this opening right here. Yep. So if um, let's just say you were to take this to your charts, you have price in a low liquidity state, and this can be any time frame. But uh, what we try to do is is someone might say, well, I'm just more interested in longer hold times and swing trades. Um, well, if you engage in learning on the smaller time frames, you can, you, you can scale that out to the larger time frames. So what you're actually doing is you're intensifying the, the, the rate at which you are learning about price. But let's just take a very, very simple breakout scenario. So you'll find that this is uh, fragmented into parts. And then usually at the end, you've got prices in a very low liquidity state. And when price breaks out like this, you will take it to the smaller time frames just to kind of get a sense as to how the price discovery occurred on the breakout. And if it went, because when price, remember when price breaks this area right here, it goes into a new state of liquidity, a new way in which price is delivered and liquidity is delivered. But just when price eventually makes it back, if price comes back in a fairly direct manner, just simply take an exercise, buy it here, place, call it a 10 and 10, a 10 pip stop, 10 pip limit, buy it right here and watch how price plays out. Now there's going to be characteristics of price and deposits of liquidity on this move, as well as this move. And then as price plays out, then it's going to start to give you more and more information. Mm -hmm. right? So you want to, so as you engage in an exercise here, as it pertains to this specific structure and price, and again, we're taking the most basic example, then here's what happens. And this is kind of just, uh, you know, just kind of an introductory understanding of where we're going with this is that. When you have a price structure that you're looking at and a behavior that you're looking for, and as you're watching it play out, and as price comes back and you engage in, uh, in the market, so what you're doing is you've opened up your demo account, you've uh, pulled up your trade ticket, you have set your parameters on your trade ticket, you have your finger on the trigger, you're watching price as it moves towards that level, this this entire uh, action, this this the the entirety of this exercise is discreetly mm -hmm. and subconsciously developing process. Okay, and and even it's as even it's as simple as something like this type of behavior, you are developing process. So um, what you know what a lot of people so so for everything from everything from uh, uh, you know, identifying um, the state of the market to the price move, even watching price come down to that level is internalizing price behavior as it pertains to this market structure, okay? Even when you're watching price go down, okay, this is the one when it hits, no, it doesn't, it goes back up, it comes down again, goes back up. So all of this, all of this engagement because you are doing it in an environment that is structured, it is it is internalizing, uh, and it's and it's connecting your uniqueness to that of market behavior. So as price starts to move, mm -hmm. even even to the extent that when you pull the trigger, it is creating habit, and it is defining every time you pull the trigger, it is bringing you closer to how you're ultimately gonna pull the trigger when the game is on, right? So, so, but most people, most people are doing this randomly without any structure. So you wanna start out with one simple task and you do 50, 100, 200, 500, 1,000 mm -hmm. different engagements. And before you know it, you're going to change how your brain thinks about this type of this type of move. So what most traders will do, um, and again, this this breakout scenario can be on a one minute, five minute, sixty minute. What most traders will do is when price breaks out, they can't stand it any longer, so they buy it right here. 
Yep. Okay. They buy it right here because the entirety of the scenario that is playing out impulses them to think that, to, to, to feel, which is, you know, kind of a first mistake, to feel and how they feel makes them think that and how they act is that this is a good place to buy because I don't want to miss this trade. Only to find that price comes all the way back, hits on some structure, starts to build some formation because the manner in which price forms down here is also very important. And that's a whole other subject matter. Yep. But, but they, they, they just can't stand it. So when they see price ticking down, ticking lower, ticking lower, they actually become more fearful. So we're actually trying to change how your brain thinks when it's here versus how your brain thinks when it's here. And usually what we're doing is we're actually completely uh, doing a 180 on how your brain thinks and then how you respond to price in these different scenarios. So when at one point in your trading career, you thought this was the right thing to do and it made you feel good, um, but the outcome over a very large sample size is quite negative and quite painful, right? So, yep. and then over time where this was at first very uncomfortable and every time you pulled the trigger in this scenario, it was quite uncomfortable and you didn't know exactly where to pull the trigger because there's more dynamics to it than just simply coming back here. Uh, over time, you become highly refined in where to pull the trigger here. And so over time, your body actually uh, your, your brain actually changes how it thinks about this and how it thinks about this in the completely the opposite, yep. right? And when it's going to pull the trigger. So you've, you've heard people say, um, well, they have a very good feel for price or I'm trading on feeling. Well, that's, you know where that feeling comes from. That feeling comes from uh, very, very large sample sizes of, of exercises and internalizing price behavior. That's, yeah. that's where it comes from. Absolutely. If, yeah. you, if you've been trading randomly or trying to copy what somebody else does, then, then you're going to have random results mm -hmm. and your brain is going to be so confused that that you don't know really know what to do or what to expect. Because, because what happens with a lot of traders is once they get in the trade, they're like, okay, that's done. So I've I've now uh, I've now satisfied the emotion of wanting to get into a trade, but now a no, a, now a, a, a whole new, even more powerful emotion comes upon you in what do I do with that trade now, right? And if you're trying to copy what somebody else does, you're dealing with very limited information versus, yeah. actually, versus actually having built the foundation of the model yourself in relation to your uniqueness. Right. So, yep. um, so, and that, that's what comes into play when you are ultimately made, making your trade selection because, and, 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 and I have, uh, you know, members will email me saying, saying, you know, um, after all of my sample sizes, I have found it most productive to enter, um, you know, certain trade scenarios like this, which is not necessarily how I would do it, mm -hmm. but it works, but it works for them. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. And, and so, and that again is, is really optimizing your, your uniqueness and having gone through the process of extracting and finding the best of, of yourself and your uniqueness. Yeah, it's a great way to put it. And I always say that uh, gut feeling is just a fancy, sexy word, but at the end of the day, what's behind under the hood is having created a frame of reference and having built neural pathways through repetition. And what people understand as gut feeling is just simply you tap into the collection of your experience through many, many practices of this specific pattern. And that would be what people understand as gut feeling, which obviously transcends way beyond that word. It is just simply that, that compounding effect of going through 50, 100, 1,000 of this patterns, contextual settings. And yes. it's, such a, it's such a great way to put it. And uh, you've been also emphasizing that the feeling, the feeling of engaging when the market's starting to run away 
uh, that uh, that already is a red flag, right? I mean, it's like it's uh, you are not following a specific um, specific guidelines for you to engage in the market, but rather you are more kind of like uh, engaging for the sake of it or out of uh, impulses, and obviously that is going to lead you down a path of uh, you know it could be quite detrimental over the long run. So really, really um, excellent explanation. Now, when the price visits this and taps back into what used to be a level of resistance within that range, and now it is anticipated to be support because there's been a change in the liquidity dynamics, would you uh, primarily enter limit orders? Are you waiting for some type of signal through price action? What is your take? And then how you place your stop losses? And talking about the risk management and how you manage these trades, I know that you are a proponent of placing initially a rather broad stop loss. It could be 10 pips, 20 pips, depending obviously on the time frame that you're trading. And then uh, as the price moves in your favor, you, you start to adjust your uh, stop loss. And also something that you promote, uh, at least from my findings and my uh, years of following you is that taking fractions of losses that makes a big difference as well and then obviously letting the the winners run if you could touch yes. on that that would be great yes so um there was one other point i was going to explain but let me just first um comment on yeah. one of your points in that um my my trading models are also of fractal nature so mm -hmm. the way in which i am entering for a short term hold time trade is going to be highly similar to the way that I'm entering the market structurally on a longer term time frame. So, so basically, the short term time frames, uh, while uh, while I am always in connection with the fundamental environment, uh, you know what's going on and what's driving price, um, my 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 positioning, taking on positions and managing positions is is primarily based on. Uh, price volatility, price relationships. Mm -hmm. So, but the longer the hold times, the more I'm 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 involving fundamentals as an underlying driver to to the um, to the price. So, what I'll do is let me explain one thing, and I'm not sure if people can see my face yep. for expressions, but they can. Yeah, I, yes. They, they, they Sometimes I, I think maybe they're just listening to my chart talking. <laughs> so, no, no. Okay, they got dual right, images. So, so you can see my you can see my expression. So yes. first of all. I'll explain one thing and then I'll get into some of the basic structure of taking on a position and 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 managing the, the position. So if you have um, if price is here and you have liquidity up here, price moves from one point of liquidity to the next, as we have pointed out. So you can mm -hmm. see here price establishes. We're just going to call support resistance and uh, areas because this can be broken down into about four different pieces. We'll just, just call this liquidity. Price moves out in a new state of liquidity, draws back, picks up liquidity, and you know develops some profile here. Breaks out, comes back, picks up liquidity, and the process repeats itself. Right. So you have um, if price is going from one point of liquidity to next, and price breaks out. The question is, how does it get there? So it can get there straight like this, mm -hmm. or it can be uh, modestly efficient, more efficient, or, you know, highly, highly efficient like this. Mm -hmm. So it can get there in multitude of ways. Yep. In the meantime, as price proceeds to that area, price is moving. So if you take a snapshot in here, price is moving from one point of liquidity to the next point of liquidity or price exhaustion back to liquidity. And it's usually going from the smaller being lower priority to the larger being higher priority. So if you have price breaks out and you've got smaller levels of liquidity like this, as price draws back, it'll hit the small levels insignificantly or immaterial. You'll see price pauses, a shift in the way price is delivered, and then you'll see a more material response at the larger levels. Okay, and so, but every time price moves, it leaves in, in its trail little pockets of liquidity that are very, very, very important. So you can see here, you've got uh, some structure right here, price rises, it comes back, 
um, hits liquidity there. As price breaks out, it gets weaker, weaker, weaker. It hits the larger framework. And then you can see price draws back up that weak leg and hits the larger framework, picks up liquidity and draws back lower. So that's just a couple of examples. Now, um, so price is constantly moving from one point of liquidity to the next. And again, depending upon uh, uh, the weakness that is, that is uh, manifesting throughout the move or uh, in comparison to the strength of the level it's moving towards. Um, that's that's a five hour lesson on its own. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. So anyway, I'm not even gonna dare to ask you because okay. it can be. So uh, anyway, let's just say that um, this is a level mm -hmm. uh, here, and um, again, as price. And if I'm looking at trading, this is so. This is a five minute chart, and it doesn't really matter what the time frame is. Uh, the same basic principle is going to apply mm -hmm. because you asked me about risk management, and I'm just going to yeah. talk about it generally here. So again, if this is my trade level price can go straight to that level. Mm -hmm. And this level is going to be based on a certain magnitude of support that I believe exists in that area yeah. based, on the, based on the structure of price. So price can go straight to that area. Again, it can go modestly to that area. It can go more efficient to that area or highly efficient to that area, right? So you got the whole, you've got the entire spectrum and everything in between, just, just so that we're clear on that. Mm. So now, if price were to, no matter how it goes to that area, um, but if it goes straight into that area, let's just, for argument's sake, let's just say it doesn't, it doesn't matter how it moves into that area. Let me just see if I can. So price goes into that area, hits the spot. Mm -hmm. What I will do is I will take a couple levels of structure, and usually you've got the level at which you're making the trade is typically believed to be a strong level of support or resistance that warrant a that warrant a trade. Mm -hmm. And taken into consideration is the way in which it moves into that level. So, um, so this is assumed to be a pretty decent strong area. But if it breaks through that area, it's usually got one or two points at which price could also respond. And I'm usually opening up the trade down below, usually. Uh, at least one level and try to make it two levels depending on the percentage of right this, that what, is what that you is. would call layering right a few others yeah. um, well i'm not actually uh adding to positions here i'm just yeah so so really it's there's i want to give the market room to breathe so okay. if price is really screaming and blows through that level mm. usually if it gets through this level there's yeah. even a higher probability an increased probability it will respond to this level. Got it. And a remarkable probability that it will at least turn hmm. somewhere to some degree in this range, right? Understood. So, so I'm opening up the stop here and typically, um, so I'm using an overall average loss to average gain ratio. So I try to keep my overall average losses to 0.2 of 1% or less. And it's usually in the one six to one eight range. I'm trading, typically trading uh, unleveraged, and the longer the hold times, um, the the less, the lower the position size relative to the uh, uh, available capital I'm taking. So I'm I'm usually trading unleveraged, just because at this stage of my career I'm too old to be trading on big leverage. But I am trading in the crypto market as well, so so I do use a bit of leverage there. But anyway. Um, so as price draws down toward this area, I'm usually taking them. And, and, and so the, the size of this stop, while I try to keep it below 0.25 of 1%, if I've got a really good string of um, very, very small losses and my overall average loss over the last, say, 20 trades has been, has been quite exceptional, then I'm willing to take a you know, a bit of a larger stop in this area, and it can definitely exceed 0.25 of 1%, um, because my overall, because I still know it's within my overall average. And even if I get stopped out straight away on this, on this trade. Now, then this builds in the consideration of, of um, where you are on your spectrum in terms of 
how your last 10 trades went, how your last 20 trades went and where you are on that average. Mm -hmm. So that is also considered in the trade selection because again, you've got to focus on the average losses. And, and um, when you are, you should consider that the next trade that you take, every single trade that you take is the first of 10 consecutive losses, okay? So, so then what I'll do is, um, so if price comes down and it starts building a nice base, and, and particularly if it does a, uh, it moves through the lows and that's a function of the way price is being delivered. Mm -hmm. And then it comes up and starts trading above this level. Then, um, uh, so, so I will sometimes take the trade straight on and sometimes I will wait for the base to form. And if it gives me a false move to the downside, then I'm, I'm trailing it usually with a limit order one or two pips behind price mm -hmm. to answer your question. Okay. When price is coming down straight into the level, I am trading it at market. I've got my finger on the trigger and I'm waiting for just the price that I want. And here's where the price is. When price does this, remember price goes up and down, up yeah. and down, up and down. When price goes down and it moves into a new state of liquidity, mm -hmm. into where you believe will liquidity be present, I want to be among that liquidity. And that's where I'm making my entry because as price draws back up, I want to be on the positive side in the initial move. Okay. So that's a, you know, a general, a general rule. Um, and then if I'm, if it's built up a base and price is starting to look like it wants to draw back up that leg, then I'm placing a limit order right behind price as it's advancing. Um, and, and so uh, I'm usually scaling. I'm I'm trading it quite similarly for longer term uh, hold time times as well, because some of my trades I hold for six months, twelve months, as much as two years. And of course, you're in and out, and there's different strategies around that. But mm -hmm. I'm typically drawing on the same reference points. Yeah. Uh, at, at times, I ask people and traders, mentors, uh, whether or not. Uh, and how, let, let me rephrase that, how much weight they place into backtesting. But obviously you've already touched that you go through very specific requirements in terms of building the skills uh, on each and every department. Now, on top of that, do you also encourage uh, students to go through their own backtesting and to see all coming together? And if so, what is the process like? Do you generally uh, suggest, hey, go through a specific period of backtesting, then simulation, and only if you start to get the feel of it or maybe your uh, results in simulation practice are good enough, then you can move into the uh, live account. What, what should be the process like or the default, I guess, uh, template that uh, you so, would recommend? Yeah. So we do have a process. Mm -hmm. And um, there is a video on in the free members area that explains the process to some extent. Uh, so what we do is, um, you know, you start out with simple and small mm -hmm. so that they understand how to play the game um, by, by breaking down one price behavior. And some will go and backtest. The challenge with backtesting is um, um, you need to know when the data releases are because that can skew the data because, yeah. because just prior to the data, the, the um, market moves into a different state. Um, and then post data, of course, it takes time to, to flush out yeah. um, and clean through, kind of sweep the book and clean through some of the liquidity before it stabilizes. So that it's important to, 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 you know, to understand that. So many will, many will do back testing, but let's say, for example, a lot of traders, you have to adjust your trading to whatever your lifestyle is. You got kids, a job, you know, other responsibility, things like that. So you just got, you got to figure out what your life rhythm is uh, relative to your time available. Uh, and the amount of, you know, when you have time to study. So what you want to do is when you sit in front of your charts, you don't want to just sit there and, and get into a trade or, you know, uh, um, you know, just be unproductive for a course of an hour or two. You want to be engaged. So I suggest because of the fractal nature of the market and, and probably the fractal nature of however it is that one trades, um, it probably has some level of scalability, but what we do because it's price and we're, we're trading fractal nature, um, we uh, put them through engagement. So if you've only got one or two hours in a day, 
uh, you are using, fully utilizing that one to two hours and it's highly intensive so that you are engaging in a structured process to build out how you understand price and by just simply by doing exercises on smaller time frames, so that you can expand your competency as it relates to the pieces and build out the whole. Yeah. And from that, from that, your trading model comes to fruition. There you go. Yeah, perfect. Now, um, out of uh, all the years that you've been trading, uh, it has been 2021, correct me if I'm wrong, ever since uh, early 2000, correct? Intensely, yes. Intensely, yeah. Now, what would be the biggest lesson you've learned all these years? Or in other words, if you had to give a piece of advice to your younger self, what would it be? Is there anything in particular that you may highlight in, uh, in this piece of advice? Uh, so there's a couple points, yeah. um, and I won't talk too long, but... Um, yeah. Uh, you know, one is one is just like, you know, if you're raising children, you know, you've got your life experience and you try to share that with your kids, but they just got to go learn on their own. Right. Yeah. So everyone in the, the, the markets will go on their own exploratory phase um, to get to the point where they just kind of decide what they connect with. And there's no right or wrong, because if you you build out your trading model and it works for you, it works for you. It's, it's not right or wrong. So, um, so so that's something that is a natural part of the process. The, 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 you know, the emotional gyrations of going through that process. But at some point in time, you need to make a decision and move forward and engage in process. And the point at which your trading really goes through the roof is the point at which you're going to be an independent thinker. Mm -hmm. you, you, um, you no longer look for validation from others in terms of what you're thinking is right or wrong. There are emotional aspects that it is important to have a discussion with an experienced trader to say, you know, am I alone in my thinking or is this something that's common? And that's where I like to have discussions with traders to kind of say, look, you're not alone. This is a you know, natural part of the process. And here's kind of how we navigate through it and go from there. Um, so, so there is that. But there is um, a thing, a point where, and I did a video on this as well, is um, there's a point at which you become so concrete in your ability to think for yourself and, and confident enough in your level of competency and understanding the way in which you approach the market and you have found your niche in the market. Um, so just as, as a very ex base example, so I will engage, I'm constantly engaging in the exercises so that I'm in connection with market volatility and what's going on in the market. And then when I see a live trade uh, and probabilities increase on a live trade, I will decide whether or not I want to accept that trade and whether or not I think it has a good structure to it or not. So I would say that I am taking about 20 to 30% of all of the trades that I think are tradable, okay? So you need to be very, very comfortable passing on trades missing trades, getting to the point at which I can miss this one, no problem. Another one's coming along in an hour or this tomorrow or this week. You just don't, don't worry about it. And you will find that you are concentrating yep. or bringing into concentration the, the really high probability trade scenarios. Yep. Um, and you're still exercising the ones that you would have taken live, but don't yep. still exercise them but you're really increasing the overall probability and outcome of your trading performance by, by doing that. And when you get to that point where you don't feel like you got to get in at the bottom and out at the top, because if you're trying to get in at the bottom and out at the top, then you're going to burn through uh, so many trades to the one that you do hit like that, that you're not going to be, you're not going to succeed. So, um, it's really, uh, you know, when you get to that, that, that point where mentally you're comfortable with, I take the trade or I don't take the trade. There's something I don't like about it. I'll pass. Okay. So it goes 200 pips in your favor or 20 yeah. pips in your favor or moves exactly how you thought it was going to move. It doesn't matter. It's mm -hmm. inconsequential. That's fine. You've internalized it and don't worry about it. Yeah. I love that you mentioned that because one of my latest, uh, 
uh, articles that I put out for members of my mentor room, I mentioned that, uh, well, it was titled, Let the Market Come to You. And uh, I mentioned that trading should be an exercise of self-control, constrained emotions, patience, authenticity, commitment, independence, and availing to one's rules. And the list goes on. Possession of these attributes detoxes you or, or detoxes your trading soul by, by letting the market dictate when a setup is in line with your edge and, and is in the making versus forcing it. So that's pretty much encapsulating what you just uh, mentioned. And, and it, I'm grateful to, to hear that that is kind of like one of the highlight lessons that uh, you would uh, you would like to emphasize in this uh, conversation. Yeah. Yes. Well, the reason why it's a highlight is because um, everything that leads up to that point is important, but that's the end result. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But I mean, we, we've definitely gone full circle by tying things back into your processes and how you actually get to partition and break everything down create all these uh, all these regimes that uh, traders can abide by, by learning each and every department on its own, and then putting as a whole everything, and then be uh, then obviously, or, and ultimately active in the market, uh, you know, pressing the buttons, but knowing what, what they're doing. So with that being said, I wanted to ask you, because I'm curious, uh, do you have any one that has been instrumental in your progress as a trader, any mentor that you can single out? The, um, the individual who mentored me back in you know, 2000, 2001, mm -hmm. he mentored me, um, uh, he's an institutional trader and um, uh, well, he's an independent trader, but uh, was trading through uh, you know, the major banks in the Singapore and uh, London at the time. And uh, he taught me about process and uh, he chooses to remain unnamed because he was kind of like an you know, underground, call it an underground trader. Right. But um, he taught me about process and uh, we were studying price behavior till our eyes were bleeding. And he would say, and he would basically give me the tasks that I had to do that uh, day and that week and what we were looking for. And, and um, that was a remarkable experience. And it was, it was when I engaged in this process that I realized that this is just like sport. And, and so, so he, he did a remarkable job and we did so much study on price. And um, so uh, what I've done is basically packaged it in a way that's comprehensible for other traders yep and so that you still have to do the work to understand the behavior but um show you the behaviors so that you don't have to go discover them and reinvent the wheel yeah absolutely yeah now uh i want to challenge you could you name one trader that maybe you have an interest and you haven't heard about him but you would love me to interview, is there anyone that comes to mind? Is this a challenge? This is a challenge that every single person that I have a conversation uh, interview with, I ask. So hopefully that can help me to pull the strings and, and get him on board for the next conversation. Um, I never put any thought into that. Uh -huh. I, I, I think I can come up. I think I can come up with. Today I had a, a chat with Chris Capri. Uh, probably you know him from oh, Second Skies, yeah. and 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 uh, and he mentioned three names. So. Uh, you, you at least you got to give me one. <laughs> um, well, I'm trying to think of uh, individuals that do not have like a known public profile. Yeah, that, I would love that. I'd, that I'd love are really that are really hardcore solid traders. Yeah. So um, there was a guy that uh, a guy whose webinar I watched some time ago. He's Danish. I think he he um he's got a, a site trading with Tom trading with Mike. I can't I can't remember his name, but I'll go find it. Yeah. And I I I thought that um because he trades price behavior, and I thought that he was very very authentic in all aspects of trading. And um, uh, but I can't I can't remember his name. And then there was another uh, another, and I don't really watch too much of from other people, which is one of the reasons why I can't come up with anyone. I really uh, just kind of mind my own business. But um, there's another individual whose name you never really hear. 
but uh, uh, he saw price in a way similar to how I saw price. Is he uh, is he the the trader running ICT inner circle trading? No, because uh, he. he was He's someone who I want to get on board. And so at Global Prime, we're running this competition called Name Your Trading Hero. Uh, and uh, he, got, uh, he got named. Uh, his name is Michael Haddleston. And uh, he has you highly, highly regarded as someone who he's, uh, he's learned from. So yeah. I, I thought there, there would be some type of connection there with you. Yeah, yeah Michael, is, uh, he's been a member, um, uh, you know, a few times he's come in and out of the uh, right a few times yeah okay yeah so if you can think about any a, anyone else just uh i guess outside yeah. of the, this interview you can just drop me the name or the contact that would be absolutely great so that i can expand I will, I will for sure. the, the universe of uh, potential people that i can have uh, these incredible chats with now with that being said uh if people want to find out uh, more about you, obviously they can land on your website, uh, protradersclub.com, anywhere else. Are you active in YouTube these days or anything else? Or you kind no, of like I, dialing things I down? I don't do YouTube and I, and I hardly ever tweet anything. Yeah. Um, I'm just kind of in a mode where I'm just minding my own business and I, yep. enjoy, the, I enjoy the people that we have as members and, and I you know, try to give them the best uh, that I can. And, and, uh, but no, I don't, I don't do uh youtube pro traders club would be more than enough if people want to find out more about you uh yes. chris it we've gone on for almost two hours so i would say <laughs> this is a a pretty a pretty good uh, time for for us to wrap things up i still have to have dinner so pretty late getting getting <laughs> late here so uh thank you so much for taking the time as i said thank to you. you it has been an honor you replied to my email right away being very open to to this discussion i think that people can take uh, you know, uh, many uh, lessons from this conversation. Is there any parting words you got? Um, there was one point that I did want to make yeah. that I, I failed to make, and that is, um, you know, on the subject of managing, you know, managing um, who you are as a trader. Yeah. Is every every successful trader has a coping mechanism for when they take successive losses or take successive wins. And, um, and, and so they have, they have triggers and means by which they, they handle that situation. Um, so that's a very important aspect of your trading to employ. Perfect. So if people want to find out more about uh, Chris Laurie, as I said, they can uh, get in touch with you through Pro Traders Club. Uh, thank you very much for connecting with us. Uh, like, uh, subscribe and uh, comment in the channel, and I'll be more than happy to respond once this uh, video has been published. Thank you, Chris. Right. Th thank you very much. Pleasure. Pleasure.